Hola, hola, hola. Okay. <laughs> sí, uh, me llamo Joel Breton. Uh, yo soy de San Francisco, California. Y ahora vivo en Londres, uh, Inglaterra. Y trabajo uh, con compañía 505 Games. Y um, hoy yo muy feliz a uh, hacer aquí en Bogotá con ustedes y voy a hablar en este tópico de um, juegos gratis uh, del App Store, este uh, nuevo mercado muy interesante a mí y también uh, tal vez para usted. Y um, ahora con su permiso voy a cambiar a inglés uh, porque <laughs> puedo hablar un poco uh, mejor en inglés. Okay. Um, so yes, uh, thanks for having me here. I'm very excited to come and uh, speak today on the topic of free-to-play games, uh, which has been my specialty for sort of the last five years of my uh, game career. Um, and, um, you know, I've been making games for about uh, 35,000 hours over the last uh, 18 years. So uh, I've pretty much decided this is going to be my career, and I'll probably stick with it at this point. Um, and I've worked at many of the sort of leading publishers in the uh, Western market. Uh, so Bethesda Softworks um, made a lot of good uh, games with those, with those, uh, with that company. Uh, Take Two Interactive and and Hudson are some of the companies that you know I've been fortunate enough to work for and you know to learn my craft and how to sort of develop games. And um, uh, there's a couple of the games I've worked on before, as was mentioned in the introduction. You know, I've worked on Unreal and Duke Nukem, Quake uh, and Doom in, in the past, so that's very much more in the core gamer market on consoles and PCs. Uh, but probably, you know, um, over the last five years, I've been focused more on the online and mobile space. And as we know, the, the pre predominant business model on those platforms has turned into the free-to-play and, and some of the different flavors of free gaming. Um, so, you know, currently I'm working at 505 Games, as I mentioned, and we're building out a, a nice portfolio of free uh, games across all platforms that, you know, the business model will work on. So that's the App Store and on, um, on, uh, the, on the web and, of course, in social networks um, such as Facebook. And uh, we have some really cool games already out there that you can check out if you get a chance. Um, we have a really good core game on the iPhone and iPad called Night Storm. Uh, it's a beautiful uh, sort of night jousting game. And so you get to build your knight up and, you know, level him up to where he has a high level of armor and, and, um, and weapons. And then go and play multiplayer battles against other knights um, online. And so it's a asynchronous battle mode, and uh, we've been running this as a live service on, on uh, the App Store, uh, for about the last eight months, and uh, we have over a million and a half players uh, that have downloaded the app and and are actively playing with us right now. So check that out if you get a chance. Okay. So here's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, I'm going to just talk about uh, really quickly a recap of you know the free to play. Uh, history uh, in the Western markets, primarily, since that's where I've been focused and you know 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 the most about. Uh, and then I'm going to get into some actual keys to success that we've found, you know, for for attacking this market and uh, finding ways to you know make uh, make the the business model work, and especially focused around monetization. As you know, if if you don't uh, find ways to monetize. Uh, the players of your game, you're not going to be able to survive for very long. So it's obviously key to figure this out. Um, so I'm going to tell you some of the tricks that, that we've learned and hopefully you know, that may help you if you're interested in um, working in this market. And uh, then at the end, I'm just going to talk just a, a little bit and touch on um, free-to-play publishing partnerships, which is what we're actively doing at 505 Games and which we're very interested in talking to developers about uh, partnering with us. Um, so I'll close with that. And um, yeah, so I thought it'd be helpful to just start with some definitions. Uh, there's a lot of um, different, uh, actually, you know, words and definitions being used for free-to-play games. So, you know, these are my definitions. They're mostly uh, commonly used in the industry, but of course there's different, different people use different definitions. Um, but I thought I'd just let you know which ones um, that I'm focused on, at least in my current uh, 
companies. So we have uh, the, the top definition here is free to play. And this is defined by games that, you know, the first download that you get is free. Uh, so the player has very little friction. They don't have to pay anything. Uh, they download the game. And then the game is obviously monetized by upgrades, in-app purchases, uh, shortcuts, decorations, uh, better armor, bigger swords, uh, that sort of thing. So that's, that's uh, the free-to-play market, which is obviously booming in the App Store currently. Um, then there's the pay-to-play market. And um, this is the opposite of free-to-play. And that means that the first download that you get is, uh, is a paid download. Um, and it actually you know, costs anywhere from 99 cents to even up to $20, essentially, uh, for, that, for that download. And uh, actually, there's very, we're, at, at 505, we're focusing on both of these t first two models currently, and we're finding success in both. So uh, a tip that I have for you is to, um, uh, different games really are designed better for different models. And uh, through, the, through the talk today, I'll try to focus a little bit on, you know, if you have a game, deciding which of these four business models is going to find the most success. Uh, but uh, I can tell you that we just released a game called Terraria on the App Store last Thursday. Um, and uh, if you get a chance, download it. It's a uh, 4 dollars uh, download. And within 24 hours of releasing it, um, it had shot to the top position in, in uh, the US iPhone and I iPad store. Um, as far as a uh, number of downloads and so and we're still there at uh, I believe number one or number two today um, And that's a that's a five dollar game and it's you know got over several hundred thousand downloads in the first five days of release So it shows that there is still absolutely a market for this pay-to-play market as well um, so then the next one is is freemium and now this is a, a free free to play game, but it has premium payments for features like memberships, for instance, or you know, a full version of the game. So if there's a light, uh, a light version of a game, but it's just a, a limited version and it's trying to upsell you to another game, um, or if a game has uh, additional level packs that you can buy, um, that's going to fall sort of more in, in what we call the freemium business model. And then there's a very interesting one, which is the bottom one called Paymium. And Paymium is uh, probably one of my favorites right now. Um, and we're definitely looking to attack this market pretty aggressively. So what happens in this model is uh, you pay for the first download, uh, but then inside of there is also a very robust store full of shiny ar armor and you know, longer swords and more powerful uh, weapons uh, that, that can be purchased for additional uh, cash. So you get money from the first download, which is great. You start getting some some monetization going there, but then you also have a store and a very good economy inside the game so that you can continue to monetize the users that get very engaged in your game. So this is a, actually a very exciting model, and uh, there's a few games out there that have found really good success with this, and uh, we're, we're gonna be attacking this model ourselves at, at 505 Games. Uh, so let me just do a quick recap. I'll try to hurry through this uh, of, of the brief history of you know, the, the free, free to play games in the Western market. So the first part, you know, was basically the casual downloads where it started around 2000, and that was on the, the game portals like Big Fish and Yahoo and iWin. Um, and I was making some games in, the, in those days like Ice Cream Tycoon and War Chess. And what, what those were is there was a free demo, and uh, we would get, give those games out. It would be a limited by either time or by levels that you could play. And um, the idea of the demo was purely to get people interested, get them hooked in, on your game, uh, and then try to upsell to a full $20 version, which again was just a, an additional download. And this market boomed through the early sort of 2000s. And uh, again, it's, you know, I, I put it into the, uh, into the free to play market, um, even though it's more of a freemium, because it was uh, a free game that was trying to upsell you to um, the monetized full version. And uh, so that's actually still going today, that model. There's still <clears throat> the game portals out there that are selling those games, but there's much less um, excitement or interest or volume in those markets today as you know, the App Store and, and the new free-to-play models uh, emerged. Uh, so then RuneScape, there was the MMOs, mostly targeted around kids. And these were free-to-play MMOs, very deep games, but that you could play for free, you could get sort of engaged, um, and then there was some premium subscriptions of either five, ten dollars a month that you could pay if you really liked the game, and that would give you access to additional areas, uh, more features for customization, et cetera. And RuneScape 
Club Penguin and uh, Neopets were really the leaders in that in that market, and they're still going on today. Although again, this is kind of dying down a bit in terms of revenue and players. Um, and then Xbox Live Arcade uh, appeared, and uh, of course, this was. Uh, um, the first console that made uh, basically all of the games uh, had a free demo that came with it. And so this was again kind of going after the, the freemium model where they would give you away a, a, a few levels of the game, maybe the first two or three levels, try to get you hooked and interested in the game and then try to sell you the full version at anywhere from 5 to $15. And that's still going very robustly today, that market. Um, and I expect that it'll carry over to the new consoles as well. Um, then there's the PC game market, uh, did the same thing. It's actually been going since sort of the late 90s where the PC games would offer a demo and trying to upsell you to the full version of anywhere up to $50 to $60 for the full version. Um, and then a very exciting thing happened on June 29th in 2007, uh, and that was the release of the iPhone. And uh, the smartphones basically from that day onward um, have come to... Uh, really uh, make a lot of waves and a lot of noise in the overall global game market. Um, and so I look back at that day as a, as a very historic point. Um, those first apps that were in the App Store uh, when, the, uh, when the iPhone launched were 99 cents primarily. There was very few uh, free apps um, in, in, in sort of the free-to-play model that we're, that we're seeing today. Um, most of the apps were, were dominated by sort of 99 cent downloads. And they did very well for quite a while, for a few years. That was the ecosphere. Um, and then the freemium uh, demo, you know, demo version market developed quickly thereafter. And um, you know, people would sell light versions to try to upsell to the full versions. And uh, that was sort of the next year of the App Store. Um, and at this same time, Facebook game uh, developers and publishers discovered compulsion loop driven gameplay. Um, and I'll get into that a little bit later, but essentially this is where virtual goods, microtransactions, um, and free-to-play gaming came to online and social network gaming in a big, big way. And these companies really discovered the secret to success, which we'll, again, go into in a moment. Um, but uh, that's still a very active and, and busy market uh, today on the, on the social networks, on the web, and, of course, in the App Store. Um, and then shortly thereafter, the compulsion loop-driven free-to-play model really took over the App Store, and this was around 2010, 2011. Uh, the first compulsion loop driven uh, virtual goods, free to play games appeared, and consumers just took, uh, took to them because consumers really like free. Um, if you can give something for free, and they can test it out, and they can try it, and see if they like it, um, the, it's, a, it's a good proposition for, uh, for, for the consumers. And so it soon came to dominate, and uh, within about a year, uh, most of the top grossing apps on the App Store, I think uh, within a year, it was about 70% of the top 100 grossing apps in the App Store were, were using the free-to-play business model. And uh, it's become such a, a juggernaut, so to speak, today, that um, actually there are, there are games um, that, are, that we <coughs> are aware of the, the metrics on, that uh, they have groups of sort of 50 players in, inside the game that have monetized uh, overall to a, a, about a million U.S. dollars. Um, so that's, a, if you could imagine that, that's a group of 50 players paying a developer uh, more than a million dollars to, uh, to play their game. So it shows the power of the free-to-play model that there's no top end for how much players can spend. If you charge a set download fee, of you know five dollars or twenty dollars, whatever it is, you, you're limiting the actual top amount of money that you can make in that game. However, if you're using the free-to-play model or the premium model, um, you, you there's no limit to how much that game can actually make. Uh, as long as players are engaged, as long as they love it, and as long as you offer them a, a good opportunity to you know enjoy it and have fun in your game, you can make a ridiculous amount of money, which of course is what business is all about. Since we're in the um, for-profit sector of business. Um, so, so now, you know, we look at uh, where's, where's the games business headed? We're obviously, um, you know, uh, at 505 Games, we're making games across all platforms from PlayStation 3 to, you know, the Xbox 360, uh, and of course the App Store and Facebook and uh, other social networks. So we're all trying to figure out, okay, what's gonna happen next? And I think, you know, for developers, that's a good thing to understand. The market's very dynamic, it's moving very quickly. 
So um, we all should uh, have our eye on the future to see what's going to happen. And you know, this is what, what I think is going to happen. Of course, it's just my uh, personal insight. So take it or leave it if you you know if you think it's useful. Uh, but uh, I think that free to play games is is here to stay. <clears throat> um, I think that again, since the consumers get to try the game for free and then uh, only pay once they really like it. I think that the consumers will vote, and that, that means that this model is going to work very well for both consumers and developers. Um, I think also that the app economy itself is going to continue to dominate, um, and um, it'll start appearing, you know, it's on mobile now, uh, it's going to be on your TV. Uh, actually, I think Samsung already has an uh, app store on, on their TVs, the, the, the new TVs that are installed. PC, of course, Intel has an app store. Microsoft has an app store. Everybody has an app store now. Um, and of course, on tablets, um, also in cars, there's now screens being inserted You know, in the front of uh, all the cars for GPS, navigation, et cetera, one in the back for the kids to watch DVDs. And of course, uh, apps will be available there. Uh, very very soon, um, and on airplanes as well. If you you know you've got your own screen in front of you, uh, there's already apps available for for all of these screens. So you know, the only thing that's left is maybe a refrigerator. You know, to make an app for your refrigerator, and I think that's probably coming. So don't be surprised. Um, and I think you know, tablets and smartphones are going to really continue to dominate handheld gaming. Uh, the younger generation. I don't know if you've ever tried to take an iPad away from a three-year-old. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's not very easy. Like, if they're sitting there playing a game and uh, you, you think it's time, time is up for them to stop playing, uh, they don't hand over the iPad very easily. So it's clear that, uh, you know, they're, they're loving it and they're going to grow up with this their entire lives. So I think the handheld console manufacturers are, uh, are in ser serious trouble for the future. I think probably we're looking at the last, you know, dedicated portable hand, uh, handheld console generation right now uh, because the, uh, the, the tablets and the mobile phones will basically just dominate this market now. Um, and I think that also free-to-play business model will, uh, will now sort of start to cross over and invading into the core game space as well um, as, uh, you know, the next generation. So you got your Xbox One and the PlayStation 4 uh, coming out shortly. And I think that uh, since with the success of the free-to-play business model on all the other platforms, uh, I think that uh, for sure, you know, Microsoft and Sony will embrace this model as well. They've already started doing tests in the current generation. So on the Xbox 360, there's the Happy Wars game, which Microsoft is publishing themselves. Uh, Sony has several free-to-play games on the, on the PlayStation 3. Uh, and then um, at E3, World of Tanks is announced to be coming to, uh, to the console. So I think, you know, essentially, the next year or two, we'll so, so see significant growth on these consoles uh, with the free-to-play model. So that's exciting. Uh, if you're if you're understanding and uh, know how to make free-to-play games, um, that means there's a lot of different uh, platforms that you're going to be able to put your games on. Thanks. Thanks. Um, so yeah, after that, uh, that's that's a brief summary of you know the the history of free-to-play, the definitions thereof, and now let me get into the heart of the the discussion here, which I came to talk about, which is, you know, some keys to success that we've learned over the last five years and, you know, running about 30 to 40 different free-to-play games across all these platforms, you know, what's, what's central to success and what you need to keep focused on if you're attacking this, um, this opportunity. And uh, so I have a new definition for FT, F2P, which is, you know, come to be called free-to-play. And I think as a developer, you need to actually change that from free to play to, to fun to play. Uh, because a game, at the very heart of it, it has to be fun uh, or else it's not going to work. And uh, there's a lot of talk about metrics and, and tuning and uh, analytics and paying attention to user behavior. And absolutely, that's all important. But I mean, I think you have to really just take a step back from all that when you're starting your, your game development process. And, uh, just really understand, is this game fun? And as you're making it, as you're developing it, that has to be your core uh, principle that you're marching to is that making sure that you've got an incredibly fun game. And you know, this is more important than ever before because when you used to be able to charge $50, $60 for a console game or a PC game, it was in a box on a store, the consumer would go and buy that game one time, make the purchase, and go home. If they liked it, great, they had fun, they would you know, tell their friends. If they didn't, that was too bad. They already bought the game. They already gave the developer the money. And uh, so it didn't necessarily matter as much as it does today that that game is super, super fun. 
however, now that there's you know something like 500, 600,000, I've, I've lost count, uh, games in the App Store, there's hundreds of thousands. Um, so consumers have really unlimited amount of choice uh, for what kind of games they want to play. And so if, they, if you do get them to try your game, uh, it's got to be fun. And it has to stand out to that player and really speak to them as, wow, this is, I'm having a good time here. I want to play it again. I'm going to you know, come back to this game tomorrow. I'm going to play it some more. I'm going to tell my friends. And so this is really a, a, a critical uh, success factor is to make sure that you craft, like I say, uh, just really magical experiences. And um, if you've played some of these games, like I've played uh, Clash of Clans a lot, and, and um, you know, that, that I think is obviously a, a, a monstrous success on, the, um, on, on this tenant. It's fun, at least for me. So it speaks to me, and there's obviously you know, several million other players out there that, that really think this game is fun. And uh, those, those developers, my hat's off to them. They did a great job at this. And of course, uh, if people are having fun, they're going to tell their friends. And I think um, Clash of Clans is a good example of that. It spread very quickly through people's friends as they're saying, hey, you've got to check this game out. Come and play and uh, join my clan. Or you know, go and play, and I'll, I'll battle against you and steal all your gold. Uh, so, so again, you focus on fun first and foremost. And then you can get into the metrics and the analytics and all of these other uh, factors for success. Um, and uh, then a second, second key thing I'd like to bring, bring to mind today is, uh, is to build uh, really sticky compulsion loops at the heart of your gameplay. And uh, this is something that a lot of developers, when they start out, and even myself, I can admit, uh, I didn't understand this when I first started building out uh, free-to-play free games. I thought, oh, you, you know, it's virtual goods, so you make a store, put some cool you know, swords in there, you put some good... Uh, a nice horse uh, for the people to buy, and uh, and job done. That's it. Everything's going to be great. And it turns out that that's not the it's not the case. Um, it, it could work uh, that you just build a store and people just start giving you all kinds of money, but the likelihood is that that's not going to work. What you need to do is to build what I call you know really sticky compulsion loops into the game plan. I'm going to give you an example of what a compulsion loop is. Um, but without, without having this, without having a compulsion loop in your game, and probably a set of compulsion loops that are all set at different times to come due, um, it's going to be very hard for you to retain users. And the key to success is to retain your users, have them come back to your game three, four, five, six times a day, you know, maybe 30, 40 times a week. If you've got players and, and a large uh, group of players coming back to your game 40 times a week, um, you're probably doing something right. And that means you've probably got some very, very good compulsion loops inside your game. Um, so um, actually, let's go to the next slide. Uh, so here's what a compulsion loop looks like. Uh, here's several of them that I just you know, sort of mocked out quickly. Um, so if you think of a kingdom building game or a farming game, you know, these are the sort of two classic compulsion loops up here at the top. So uh, if you've got, say, a house, the house compulsion loop, and uh, so the first step in the compulsion loop is you build the house, right? Uh, then you've got to decide where to place your house in your village. These are decisions you get to make as the, as the player. So you're designing, you're being creative, you're, you're placing your house in the right place that you know, gives it your, your personal uh, touch. And then the critical part of this compulsion loop is you have to wait time uh, for, this, for this timer to run out. And, uh, and then after time has expired, let's say it's 15 or 20 minutes for this wait time step, then you get to, as a player, come and collect your reward, which is your coins or your XP or both. All right, and then guess what? You do it again. You build another house and you place that house and then you wait some more time for that one and then you come back and collect your coins and XP. And so what you're doing is you're you know, completing these uh, steps over and over again, but the critical part is you have to wait some time uh, to, in order to collect your reward. And uh, uh, the right, right here in this wait time step, this is where you can put your monetization. That's, the, that's one of the key places to put monetization is, hey, I don't want to wait time. I'd rather collect my reward now. I'm impatient. Uh, so for two virtual you know, gems or Smurf berries or whatever your you know, premium currency is, you can skip this wait time step and get straight to the reward. And so I, I like to say that a lot of the free-to-play games are really selling impatience. And uh, for players that are impatient, uh, you need to offer them the opportunity to, uh, to buy this, this sort of time skip mechanism. And this has proven 
deadly, deadly effective uh, in the early Zynga, sort of Facebook, uh, Farm Town, Farmville, all of these kind of games. That was this, this was critical. This house uh, farm was the same thing, right? You build your farm, you plant your crops, you wait time, you come back and you harvest your crops, then you build another farm and you do it over again. And by, you know, uh, as your gameplay develops and you build out your farm in town, if you recall how these games work, you come back and you have like all these rewards to collect because each of these are different compulsion loops on different timers. And players get in the back of their mind, they're like, oh, I need to go back to that game because I got to go collect that reward. So this is what drives retention and repeat play of your game. If you've got all these rewards, um, as it turns out, you know, humans like to complete tasks for, for rewards. This gives them a, a good feeling, like a little shot of endorphin in their brain. Like, ooh, I just did something good, and I just got a reward. Cool, I like that. And so they want to do it again. So if you built that into your gameplay, this, this compulsion loop of like, ooh, if I do this thing, I'm going to get this reward, and I'm going to feel good. And then you just want to do it over and over again. So that's what we're talking about by, by compulsion loops. And most state-of-the-art games, if you look in the App Store today at the, all the free games that are in the top 100 grossing, they, they don't have just one compulsion loop in them. The state-of-the-art now is something like you know, 40 or 50 compulsion loops all working together in this you know, sort of matrix of timers and rewards and collections that drive the users to you know, continue coming back to your game over and over again. And there's... Like I said, there's 40, 50 flavors of, the, of a compulsion loop. Um, and so this is absolutely critical to getting players to return to your game and to sort of have this timer in the back of their brain telling them, I need to get back to that game because i got to collect that reward. So I highly recommend if you're attacking this model uh, and working on free-to-play games business that, uh, that you think about this and consider how to put in you know, not just one, but maybe 10, maybe 15 uh, very, very compulsive uh, loops. Um, okay, and then another thing which you may have heard about is sort of what, what's called the, the minimum viable product. And uh, I think this is absolutely key to success because you could just keep making your game for years and years and years trying to get it perfect. But what you really got to do is just focus on, okay, what's, what's core to success of this game? What's going to be fun that I can develop in you know, a reasonable amount of time? So say s give yourself six months, nine months as your development time to get your first version of the game out into test uh, markets. And uh, you, you, you know, the, the best way to do it, I find, is in the design phase, just put all your features down um, and then sort of draw a circle around the ones that have to be in the game for it to be fun. And, um, and then you have outside of that circle a bunch of features that you, know, you can live without, uh, but that would really add to the gameplay if you could get them in. And uh, so those are games that you're gonna, those are features that you're gonna add in, in what we call live service after the game is already up and live. Um, and, and so that's really, put, put your gameplay uh, features into two buckets. One is absolutely critical, gotta be in before we launch. Uh, and then a second list of nice to have features, uh, but we can live without that because we'll update that in month one, month two, month three, um, as we run the game as a service. And um, um, you know what's what's good about this is that it's it's allowing very small teams to compete with very large companies. If you think about Electronic Arts and Zynga, um, they're attacking free to play uh, aggressively across you know all platforms available. Um, but there are very there are companies you know, that are much smaller than them that are uh, having even greater success on a title-by-title -title basis than these monstrous companies that have billions of dollars at their disposal. Uh, and so that's actually pretty exciting to me is that small teams you know, of 10, 15, 20, and I know a lot of them around the world, that are building out a, a little free-to-play game with you know, a, a small team, putting it out there, testing it, seeing if players like it, tuning it, fixing it, um, trying to adapt it and make it, uh, make it better. Uh, for, for monetization and retention and, and the sort of key components that you need to have for success. And, uh, and, and they're finding that they can compete and even have more uh, monetization in their games than, than the big boys in the publishing industry. So I think it's actually a very exciting time for, for teams, small developers, um, and uh, you know, we're working with, with several of them to help them find that success. Um, and uh, yeah, so metrics, you've probably heard about this as well. It is absolutely critical. And uh, basically my, my motto to, to the teams I'm working with is just track everything. Uh, everything that you can, put a flag on it. Um, you know, like, so, you know, what, um, 
how, how long players are playing the game per session, um, how often they return, you know, how many sessions they return, um, how long it takes for your players to monetize the first time. Of course, you know, what percentage of your players are monetizing. Um, player age, like, you know, what's the average lifetime of, of your playing audience. So really when you're, when you're you know, designing out your game, you gotta, you gotta track everything. Um, and then, you know, you can figure out as you're running the game what the key things are for, for your game specifically, what, what you need to be paying attention to, and that'll help you decide what features to add next. So it works in this really nice loop of uh, maybe what you thought when you launched was going to be an important feature, you find that uh, no one's actually using it. So either you need, to, you need to look at that feature and maybe it wasn't implemented correctly to, uh, to really cause enjoyment or, you know, make the players use that feature. Um, <clears throat> but uh, you you know you but you may see something else that totally surprises you that oh uh, looks like players really want to chat uh, with each other and so let's make that more robust let people chat you know just to their friends in in private or you know out in public if you don't have that so having you know strong metrics package implemented in your game lets you let the players um, tell you what what's important to them and obviously that's what you want to uh, focus on. And um, yeah, I would say for a, for a team, you know, when you're starting out, if you don't have uh, millions of dollars of, uh, at your disposal to build out your own metrics platform, luckily there's some really nice ones out there available that you can use. Um, there's free ones, and there's also ones that you can pay, say, a few thousand dollars a month um, that uh, are very robust and would cost you millions of dollars to develop yourself. So I recommend, you know, when you're starting out, just use one of these um, third-party packages and it'll save you a bunch of time and a bunch of effort. Use theirs and, you know, either for free for sort of, you know, limited feature set ones. But once you start having su success, you can put in a more robust package that costs you a few thousand or so a month. And that'll give you all the, the intelligence you need of what the players are doing inside your game. Okay. Thanks. Um, and then, you know, so after you get the, the tracking in there, then you've got to launch your game. Um, and monitor what the players are doing. And uh, you do that through what we call the, the you know, KPI or the key performance indicators. And players will tell you what's working in the game and what's not. Um, so, you know, tutorial and first time user experience are usually the first thing you need to address once you launch the game. Um, because uh, usually you find that most of your players are dropping off sometime in, in your tutorial or soon thereafter. So um, what we, we do what we call funnel analysis. And a funnel uh, is, for instance, um, you know, of 100% of the people that viewed the ad for your game, 10% um, clicked on that game or, or clicked on that ad, and 2% of those downloaded the game, right? So that's your, your user acquisition funnel. And you want to optimize that, obviously, to get each of those numbers higher and higher. Um, and then the in-game funnel starts there. And that's of the, you know, say of the 100% that installed the game, 70% of those made it to the tutorial screen one, 50% made it to tutorial screen two, and this is important to have the tracking on each of these steps, right? So your tutorial, you need to have a flag on each uh, screen so that you can see where your drop-off is. And say, you know, again, this is just a made-up example, but let's say 40% completed the tutorial. Well, that's not very good. So again, you're going to want to focus on this funnel and go and look at each of those screens. Well, let's see if I lost half of the players on screen one. I got a problem there. I need to figure out how to get 70, 80% finishing that screen. So that's going to be your, your focus right up front is to optimize your tutorial screens. And uh, almost every game needs tutorial and first time user experience help once it launches. And um, so, yeah, as I mentioned, you'll just want to focus on, on that. But, you know, hey, you may. Uh, launch and find out that say 80% of the players are getting through your tutorial. That'd be fantastic. If you get 80% of the players playing through, uh, then then you go to the next phase. It's like how many players came back the next day, and how many players came back on day three, how many players came back on day seven, right? So then then it it just expands out your your funnel analysis, and obviously you're always trying to optimize to get each of those numbers higher and higher, get the players deeper and deeper into your game. Um, and so, yeah, this is what I, I, I like to call getting your dog to hunt. Uh, that's just a metaphor for um, getting your, your game to work, right? So what you're looking for is, uh, is, is uh, these, these key performance indicators, and I look at it like, um, like a hunting dog, right? And uh, each of these uh, KPIs 
are just like another leg of, of the dog. Uh, so we've got you know retention, engagement, monetization, and virality. Those are the four legs of the dog. Um, and uh, if one of the legs is too short, um, your dog's not going to be able to hunt, right? He's not going to be able to run fast enough to go uh, get the birds. And so you need to fix that leg, that, that key performance indicator, uh, before your dog can hunt. And if two legs are too short, like they're not meeting the targets, uh, your dog definitely isn't going to be able to hunt. Um, and if three or four legs are short, that means under target, um, then you're in real trouble. Uh, with this game as a free-to-play game, and you need to consider if this, you know, if this dog is ever going to hunt or if this game is ever going to work uh, with the free-to-play business model. And so I'll just quickly go through those those four KPI because again, these are the these are the main things you need to be focused on and looking at in your metrics once you launch. So there's retention, and that's how um, <clears throat> how often players return to your game. So that's looking at you first look at day one retention, how many people came back the first day after they installed your game. Then you want to look at day three retention, how many people are still with you after the third day after an install, and then day seven, and then you can go up to day 14 and day 28. Um, so that's usually the first month. You want to have timestamps, <clears throat> and obviously you're trying to get your audience deeper and deeper into that month because that's when you have a better chance to, uh, to monetize these players. The second one is engagement. Uh, that's like how often a player is returning to your game like in the same day, how long they're playing the game. Um, and so this is, it's, this is really about time spent in your game. So if they're spending you know, 30, 40 minutes a day in your game, that's, that's pretty good. Uh, and per session as well, is, is the average session three minutes? Is it one minute? Uh, is it five minutes? Is it 20 minutes? So obviously you want those to be higher, uh, as high as, as possible, the engagement numbers. Uh, and then monetization is also key. If you don't have success here, of course, you can't pay for the whole development, the funding of your studio, et cetera. Uh, so you've got to monetize. And uh, so what you're looking at is here is your daily average revenue per user. And that's, you know, if you take your total users for the day and then the total money that you made for that day and you divide those, you'll get your, your average revenue per user for the day. And so obviously the DARPU is what you're going to be um, optimizing to get higher and higher to, uh, again, fund your, your game studio and your development process. Um, and then the final leg is uh, virality, and that's like how many people invite their friends into the game, <clears throat> how many people share it on Facebook, um, you know, take a picture from within the game and, and send it out to all their friends on their wall on Facebook, or even just uh, tell people word of mouth. Word of mouth is also virality. So um, all of these ways that people can share your game, you want to have those built into the game to make it very easy for people to share. Then the more people that are able to, uh, to find your game uh, for free uh, through, vir through the viral features. So again, those are the four legs of my hunting dog here. And uh, if you're weak, uh, as far as if the numbers are low or small um, on either of those four legs, uh, your game's going to struggle. And so that's what you need to focus on is that, that leg that's short or that two legs that are short uh, and in order to, you know, as I, as I say, get the dog to hunt or get your game to work uh, to where you can obviously turn it into a business and, uh, you know, recoup your investment and obviously hope to make profit. Um, so, yeah, this is one, you know, after you've got your game out there, uh, as I mentioned, it's just one simple equation for free-to-play success. I could have just put this up first and skipped the rest of the presentation. Um, so, but this is uh, average revenue per user has to be greater than the cost per install. Uh, and if you can get that equation to work in your game, you, you've got success. And this is what um, you know, Zynga and um, Supercell and uh, King and all of these um, companies know is that if they can acquire a user, that's how much it costs them to get somebody to install the game for less than the average revenue for each user, then they can spend money and scale this game up as high as they want because they know that they're going to make more money on each user that they get to install the game than it will cost them to uh, acquire that user. So it's really <clears throat> um, a two-phase battle. Actually, you can go ahead. Uh, it's a two-phase battle. and. Um, you know, once you've built the game, that's phase one, right? Getting the game built, development, launch it, get, that's battle phase one. Uh, then it actually becomes battle phase two, and it's a whole different science, a different art, and a different skill set, which is to build the audience inside your game, which is acquire the users, find the people to come into your game. And um, 
it's quickly, this, uh, this second phase has quickly become a very, very expensive business. Um, the, uh, it's actually more expensive to acquire millions of users now than it is to build the game up front. Um, and as a matter of fact, I can tell you that the cost per install in the App Store, uh, just as of two weeks ago, was reaching up to $6 per install for a free game. Uh, so as you can see, if you need to acquire a million users at $6 uh, per user, that's going to be a pretty expensive uh, customer acquisition process. So there's a lot of ways that you can obviously uh, optimize that, and uh, that's what you have to do is to be very smart about how you acquire users. It also points to why virality is so important, because if you can acquire a user for free through uh, the viral features in your game, that's $6 that you didn't have to pay for that particular user, and that can get your cost per install down. Um, and so it really makes it important. Um, so, yeah, um, you can have an amazing game, for instance, with, with great loops, and actually there's thousands of, of these out there on the App Store, uh, but the teams themselves don't know how to win this second part of the battle, how to acquire users, or maybe don't have the budget or funding to go and attack that part, and you can actually have a great game, and if no one finds your game, uh, you're still, uh, unfortunately, you know, without luck or without success. Uh, so, you know, developers have the opportunity to partner with um, uh, publishers that do have either networks of millions of players already available, um, and that, of course, reduces this, this cost to the developers. They don't have to worry about that part. They can focus on making the fun, making the, the compulsion loops, having the game be super fun, um, and let the publisher focus on finding this audience, this second phase of the battle. Um, and then really you just got to run each game like a business, right? So you, ha you need to have a P&L, uh, profit and loss, for your game. Um, and you can do this simply in Excel, right? Just like you would uh, a full business, but you can do it just on a game-by-game -game basis. And uh, you can put into that, that profit and loss statement what your, your key targets need to be, like how much uh, audience you, you plan to have. Okay, well, I need 50,000 uh, daily users, and I need them to be monetizing at, you know, three cents on average per user. And then you can plug that into your profit and loss and say, okay, well, that would actually, over two months, you know, that if I hit these targets, I'll make this amount of money. And I know that the game cost me, you know, this, uh, say, 100000 to make, but if I reach these performance targets, I'll have 200000 right? So this is profitable, so I can actually go forward with this game. So you should build out at the very start. Actually, you should have put this slide up at the beginning, but anyway, there it is. Uh, it, you need to have a, a, a profit and loss statement so you know when you're starting out in the game development process, like, is this a profitable business? And you can, um, there's a lot of research that you can do that show you, well, this type of game, let's say a strategy game on the iPad um, that's successful, monetizes at, you know, 10 cents daily average revenue per user. So you can use other games to see and gauge you know, what a target would be, what a good target for your, um, for your game should be before you launch it. And uh, so the, we call that benchmarking. So you go look at other games out there, and there's a lot of online sites you can go to to see how much money games are making in the similar genre. So I recommend you do that. Look at other games out there to find out you know, what's possible in this genre on that platform. Um, so, um, yeah, and then you update your P&L. So once you go live, you, then you have the actual data. So you had your projections. You're like, well, if we can hit a 10 cent DARPU, 50,000 users, and we have those for three months, we'll be profitable. Uh, and then you launch the game, and then you can start looking at and seeing, well, let's see, how am I doing against that target? Like, am I hitting those target numbers? Um, is it possible for me to have success in this game? And you can also see which, which you need to focus on next to try to uh, optimize. Um, and, um, you know, the, the free-to-play games business is very tricky to get right, as I've sort of gone through these different things. It's not easy at all. You have to have a lot of elements come together in the right sort of element to, uh, okay, to, uh, to make a success. And so um, let's go ahead and run to the next one. I think I'm just going to wrap up here. Uh, the last thing I wanted to point out was just, um, uh, you know, we've, we've developed a model at 505 Games where... You know, we can handle the, um, the publishing side, the metric side, uh, the analytics side, and the distribution side, uh, because that's what we're good at. And then we partner with developers uh, that can focus on then the development, the fun, uh, getting the, the compulsion lo loops right. And uh, so that lets both the developer focus on what they're good at and then publishers to focus on what they're good at. So it's certainly worth looking at um, if you are looking to make a free-to-play game 
um, consider looking at some of the publishers that, that may be able to help you again in that, in that second phase of the battle so that you can focus on the first phase and try to find success that way. Uh, and with that, I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up. Thank you very much for your time. I hope I've been helpful, and uh, good luck.